Charlotte's Web, Chapter Four, Loneliness. The next day was rainy and dark. Rain fell on the roof of the barn and dripped steadily from the eaves. Rain fell in the barnyard and ran in crooked, in crooked courses down into the lane where thistles and pigweed, pigweed grew. Rain spattered against Mrs. Zuckerman's kitchen windows and came gushing out of. The、um, down spots, rain fell on the backs of the sheep as they grazed in the meadow. When the sheep tired of standing in the rain, they walked slowly up the lane and into the fold. Rain upset Wilbur's plans. Wilbur had planned to go out this day and dig a new hole in his yard. He had other plans too. He plan his plans for the day went something like this. Breakfast at six thirty, skim milk, crusts, mid middlings, middlings, bits of donuts, wheat cakes with drops of maple syrup sticking to them, potato skins, leftover custard pudding with raisins, and bits of shredded wheat. Breakfast would be finished at seven. From seven to eight, Wilbur planned to have a. Talk with Templeton, the rat that lived under his trough. Talking with Templeton was not the most interesting occupation in the world, but it was better than nothing. From eight to nine, Wilbur planned to take a nap outdoors in the sun. From nine to eleven, he planned to dig a hole or trench, and possibly find something good to eat buried in the dirt. From eleven to twelve, he planned to stand still and watch flies on the board, watch bees in the cover, and watch swallows in the air. Twelve o'clock, lunch time. Middlings, warm water, apple parings, meat gravy, carrot scrapings, meat scraps, stale hominy, and the wrap wrapper of a package of cheese. Lunch would be over at one. From one to two, Wilbur planned to sleep. From two to three, he planned to scratch itchy places by rubbing against the fence. From three to four, he planned to stand perfectly still and think of what it was like to be alive, and to wait for fern. At four would come supper: skim milk, provender, leftover sandwich from Blurby's lunchbox, prune skins, a morsel of this, a bit of that, fried potatoes. Marmalade drippings, a little more of this, a little more of that, a piece of baked apple, a scrap of upside-down cake. Wilbur had gone to sleep thinking about these plans. He awoke at six and saw the rain, and it seemed as though he couldn't bear it. I get everything all beautifully planned out, and it has to go and rain, he said. For a while, he stood gloomily indoors. Then he walked to the door and looked out. Drops of rain struck his face. His yard was cold and wet. His trough had an inch of rain rainwater in it. Templeton was nowhere to be seen. "Are you out there, Templeton?" called Wilbur. There was no answer. Suddenly, Wilbur felt lonely and friendless. One day, just like another, he groaned. "I'm very young. I have no real friend here in the barn." It's going to rain all morning and all afternoon, and fern won't come in such bad weather. Oh, honestly! And Wilbur was crying again, for the second time in two days. At six thirty, Wilbur heard the banging of a pail. Lurvy was standing outside in the rain, stirring up breakfast. Come on, pig," said Lurvy. Wilbur did not budge. Lurvy dumped the slops, sc- scrapped the pail, and walked away. He noticed that something was wrong with the pig. Wilbur didn't want food; he wanted a love. He wanted a friend, someone who would play with him. He mentioned this to the goose, who was sitting quietly in the in a corner of the sheepfold. "Will you come over and play with me?" he asked. "Sorry, Sonny, sorry," said the goose. "I'm sitting, sitting on my eggs. Eight of them." Go to got to keep them toasty, toasty, toasty warm. I have to stay right here. I'm no fibberty, ibberty, gibbet. 
I do not play when there are eggs to hatch. I am expecting goosings. Well, I didn't think you were expecting woodpeckers," said Wilbur bitterly. Wilbur next tried one of the lambs. "Will you please play with me?" he asked. "Certainly not," said the lamb. "In the first place, I cannot get into your pen, as I am not old enough to jump over the fence. In the second place, I am not interested in pigs. Pigs mean less than nothing to me." "What do you mean, less than nothing?" replied Wilbur. I don't think there is there is any such thing as less than nothing. Nothing is absolutely the limit of nothingness. It's the lowest you can go. It's the end of the line. How can something be less than nothing? If there were something that was less than nothing, then nothing would not be nothing. It would be something, even though it's just a very little bit of something. But if nothing is nothing, then nothing has. N- Then nothing has nothing that is less than it is. Oh, be quiet," said the lamb. "Go play by yourself. I don't play with pigs." Sadly, Wilbur lay down and listened to the rain. Soon he saw the rat climbing down a slanting board that he used as a stairway. "Will you play with me, Templeton?" asked Wilbur. "Play," said Templeton, twirling his whiskers. "Play." I hardly know the meaning of the word. Well, said Wilbur, it means to have fun, to frolic, to run and skip and make merry. I never do those things if I can avoid them," replied replied the rat sourly. "I prefer to spend my time eating, gnawing, spying, and hiding. I am a gluten, but not a merry maker. Right now, I'm on my way to your trough." To eat your breakfast, since you haven't got sense enough to eat it yourself, and te- and Templeton the rat crept steadily along the wall and disappeared into a private tunnel that he had dug between the door and the trough in Wilbur's yard. Templeton was a crafty rat, and he had things pretty much his own way. The tunnel was an example of his skill and cunning. The tunnel enabled him to get from the barn to his hiding place under the pig trough without coming out into the open. He had tunnels and runaways all over Mister Zuckerman's farm, and could get from one place to another without being seen. Usually, he kept he slept during the daytime, and was abroad only after dark. Wilbur watched him disappear into his tunnel. In a moment, he saw the rat's sharp nose poke out from underneath the wooden trough. Cautiously, Templeton pulled himself up over the edge of the trough. This was almost more than Wilbur could stand. On this dreary, rainy day, to his to see his breakfast being eaten by somebody else, he knew Templeton was getting soaked. But there in the pouring rain, out there in the pouring rain, but even that didn't comfort him. Friendless, dejected, and hungry, he threw himself down in the manure and sobbed. Later that afternoon, Lurvy went to Mister Zuckerman. I think there's something wrong with that pig of yours. He hasn't touched his food. Give him two spoonfuls of sulphur and a little mol- molas, mol- mol- molasses, molasses," said Mister Zuckerman. Wilbur couldn't believe what was happening to him when Lurvy caught him and forced the medicine down his throat. This was certainly the worst day of his life. He didn't know whether he could endure the awful loneliness any more. Darkness settled over everything. Soon there were only shadows and the noises of the sheep chewing their cuts, and occasionally the cattle, the rattle of a cow chain, up overhead. You can imagine Wilbur's surprise when, out of the darkness, came a small voice he had never heard before. It sounded ra- rather thin, but pleasant. "Do you want a friend, Wilbur?" it said. "I'll be a friend to you. I've watched you all day, and I like you. But I can't see you," said Wilbur, jumping to his feet. "Where are you? And who are you?" "I'm right up here," said the voice. "Go to sleep." You'll see me in the morning. Chapter Five, Charlotte. 
The night seemed long. Wilbur's stomach was empty and his mind was full. And when your stomach is empty and your mind is full, it's always hard to sleep. A dozen times during the night, Wilbur woke, Wilbur woke and stared into the blackness, listening to the sounds and trying to figure out what time it was. A barn is never perfectly quiet. Even at midnight, there is usually something stirring. The first time he woke, he heard Templeton gnawing a hole in the grain bin. Templeton's teeth scrapped loudly against the wood and made quite a racket. What crazy rat! thought Wilbur. Why does he have to stay up all night grinding his slashes and destroying people's property? Why can't he go to sleep like any decent animal? The second time Wilbur woke, he heard the goose turning on her nest and chuckling to himself. What time is it? Whispered, whispered Wilbur to the goose. Probably oddly oddly about half past eleven, said the goose. Why aren't you asleep, Wilbur? Too many things on my mind, said Wilbur. Well, said the goose, that's not my trouble. I have nothing at all on my mind, but I have too many things under my behind. Have you ever tried to sleep while sitting on eight eggs? No, replied Wilbur. I suppose it is uncomfortable. How long does it take a goose, a goose egg to hatch? Approximately, approximately thirty days, all told, answered the goose. But I cheat a little. On warm afternoons, I just pull a little straw over the eggs, and go out for a walk. Wilbur yawned and went back to sleep. In his dreams, he heard again the voice saying, "I will be a friend to you. Go to sleep. You will see me in the morning." About half an hour before dawn, Wilbur woke and listened. The barn was still dark. The sheep lay motionless. Even the goose was quiet. Overhead, on the main floor, nothing stirred. The cows were resting. The horses dozed. Templeton had quit work and gone off somewhere on an errand. The only sound was slight scraping noises from the rooftop, where the weather vanes swung back and forth. Wilbur loved the barn when it was like this, calm and quiet, waiting for light. Day is almost here, he thought. Through a small window, a faint gleam appeared. One by one, the stars went out. Wilbur could see the goose flew a, a few feet away. He sat with head tucked under a wing. Then he could see the sheep and the lambs. The sky lightened. Oh, beautiful day! It is here at last. Today I shall find my friend. Wilbur looked everywhere. He searched his pen thoroughly. He examined the window ledge, stared up at the ceiling, but he saw nothing new. Finally, he decided he would have to speak up. He hated to break the lovely stillness of dawn by using his voice, but he couldn't think of any other way to locate the mysterious new friend who was nowhere to be seen. So Wilbur cleared his throat. Attention, please," he said in a loud, firm voice. "Will the party who addressed me at bedtime last night kindly make himself or herself known by giving an appropriate sign or signal?" Wilbur paused and listened. All the other animals lifted their heads and stared at him. Wilbur blushed, but he was determined to get in touch with his unknown friend. Attention, please," he said. "I will repeat the message. Will the party who addressed me at bedtime last night kindly speak up? Please tell me where you are if you are my friend." The sheep looked at each other in disgust. "Stop your nonsense, Wilbur," said the oldest sheep. If you have a new friend here, you are probably disturbing his rest, and the quickest way to spoil friendship is to wake somebody up in the morning before he is ready. How can you be sure your friend is an early riser? I beg everyone's pardon," whispered Wilbur. "I didn't mean to be objectionable." Objectionable. He lay down meekly in the manure, facing the door. He did not know it, but his friend was very near. And the old sheep was right; the friend was still asleep. Soon, Lurvie appeared with slops for breakfast. 
Wilbur rushed out, ate everything in a hurry, and licked the trough. The sheep moved off down the lane. The gander waddled along behind them, pulling grass. And then, just as Wilbur was settling down for his morning nap, he heard again the thin voice that had addressed him the night before. Salutations, said the voice. Wilbur jumped to his feet. Salute what? he cried. Salutations, repeated the voice. What are they? And where are you? screamed Wilbur. Please, please tell me where you are. And what are salutations? Salutations are greetings, said the voice. When I say salutations, it's just my fancy way of saying hello or good morning. Actually, it's a silly expression. And I am surprised that I, that I used it at all. As for my whereabouts, that's easy. Look up here in the corner of the doorway. Look, here I am. Look, I'm waving. At last, Wilbur saw the creature that had spoken to him in such a kindly way. Stretched across the upper part of the doorway was a big spider web, and hanging from the top of the web, head down, was a large gray spider. She was about the size of a gumdrop. She had eight legs, and she was waving one of them at Wilbur in a friendly greeting. See me now? she asked. Oh, yes, indeed, said Wilbur. Yes, indeed. How are you? Good morning. Salutations. Very pleased to meet you. What is your name, please? May I have your name? My name, said the spider, is Charlotte. Charlotte what? asked Wilbur eagerly. Charlotte a Kvatica. But just call me Charlotte. I think you're beautiful, said Wilbur. Well, I am pretty, replied Charlotte. There's no denying that. Almost all spiders are rather nice looking. I'm not as flashy as some, but I'll do. I wish I could see you, Wilbur, as clearly as you can see me. Why can't you? asked the pig. I'm right here. Yes, but I'm nearsighted, replied Charlotte. I've always been dreadfully nearsighted. It's good in some ways, not so good in others. Watch me wrap up this fly. A fly that had been crawling along Wilbur's trough had flown up and blundered into the lower part of Charlotte's web and was tangled in the sticky threads. The fly was beating its wings furiously, trying to break loose and free itself. First, said Charlotte, I dive at him. She plunged head first toward the fly. As she dropped, a tiny silken thread unwound from her knee from her rear end. Next, I wrap him up. Up. She grabbed the fly, threw a few jets of silk around it, and rolled it over and over, wrapping it so that it wouldn't move. Wilbur watched it. Wilbur watched in horror. He could hardly believe what he was seeing, and although he detested flies, he was sorry for this one. There, said Charlotte. Now I knock him out. Uh, out. So. So I'll be more so it will be more comfortable. She bit the fly. He can't do anything now, she remarked. He'll make a perfect breakfast for me. You mean you eat flies? Gasped Wilbur. Wilbur. Certainly, flies, bugs, grasshoppers, choice beetles, moths, butterflies, tasty cockroaches, gnats, midgets, daddy long legs, centipedes, mosquitoes. Crickets, and anything that is careless enough to get caught in my web, I have to live, don't I? Why, yes, of course," said Wilbur. "Do they taste good? Delicious, of course. I don't really eat them. I drink them. Drink their blood. I love blood," said Charlotte, and her pleasant thin voice grew even thinner and more pleasant. "Don't say that," groaned Wilbur. Please don't say things like that. Why not? It's true, and I have to say what is true. I am not entirely happy about my diet of flies and bugs, but it's the way I, but it's the way I'm made. A spider has to pick up a living somehow, or other, and I happen to be a trapper. I just naturally build a web and trap flies and other insects, 
My mother was a trapper before me. Her mother was a trapper before her. All our family have been trappers, way back for thousands and thousands of years. We spiders have been laying for the flies and bugs. It's a miserable inheritance," said Wilbur gloomily. He was sad because his new friend was so bloodthirsty. "Yes, it is," agreed Charlotte, "but I can't help it. I don't know how the first spider in the early days of the world happened to think that this fancy idea of spinning a web, but she did, and it was clever of her too. And since then, all of us spiders have to work the same trick." It's not a bad pitch, on the whole. It's cruel," replied Wilbur, who did not intend to be argued out of his position. "Well, you can't talk," said Charlotte. "You have your meals brought to you in a pail. Nobody feeds me. I have to get my own living. I live by my wits. I have to be sharp and clever, lest I go hungry. I have to think things out, catch what I can, take what comes." And it just so happens, my friend, that 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 what comes is flies and insects and bugs, and furthermore," said Charlotte, shaking one of her legs. "Do you realize if I didn't catch bugs and eat them, bugs would increase and multiply and get so numerous that they destroy the earth, wipe out everything." "Really," said Wilbur, "I wouldn't want that to happen. Perhaps your web is a good thing after all." The goose had been listening to this conversation and chuckling to him to herself. There are lots of things Wilbur doesn't know about life, she thought. He's really a very innocent little pig. He doesn't even know what's going to happen to him around cr- Christmas time. He has no idea that Mr. Zuckerman and Lurvy are plotting to kill him. And the goose raised himself a bit and poked her eggs a little further under her. So that they would receive the full heat from her warm body and soft feathers. Charlotte stood quietly over the fly, preparing to eat it. Wilbur lay down and closed his eyes. He was tired from his wakeful night and from the excitement of meeting someone for the first time. A breeze brought、uh, brought him the smell of clover, the sweet-smelling world beyond his fence. Well, he thought, I've got a new friend, all right, but what a gamble friendship is! Charlotte is、uh, Charlotte is fierce, brutal, scheming, bloodthirsty, everything I don't like. How can I learn to like her, even though she is pretty and, of course, clever? Wilbur was merely suffering the doubts and fears that often go with finding a new friend. In good time, he was to discover that he was mistaken about Charlotte. Underneath her rather bold and cruel exterior, she had a kind heart, and she was to prove loyal and true to the very end.